My first aim was to document the disparities in adverse birth outcomes among groups of black women. So when I talk about across the diaspora, I specifically am looking at African-American women, African women, and Caribbean women. The latter two are being defined by as in born in Africa or born in the Caribbean and have migrated to the US. I was fortunate to be able to use New York City vital birth records data, which is very exciting because in 2008, they started collecting information on duration of US residents, um, which isn't typically collected on birth certificates data. So that's exciting because I was able to address two research questions, the first of which is, what is the association between nativity and preterm birth? So simply looking at the preterm birth differentials by nativity, so with African Americans, Africans, and Caribbeans. And the second is, what is the association of dur duration of US residents in this relationship that we're seeing? So very exciting work to be done. And I'll talk a little bit more about why duration isn't typically examined for the black population. Second aim, and the one we'll focus on today, was my qualitative strand of my, of my mixed methods dissertation, and explores the role of racial discrimination, primarily looking at the relationship between black identity and discrimination for these three groups. I focused on two research questions, the first of which was, are there qualitative differences in the narrative on one's relationship to their racial identity? So do they orient to their identity in different ways? Do they speak about it in different ways? The second, are their experiences with racial discrimination any different? So do they talk about those differently? What, are, what is the nature of that? OK. So I just want to also give an overview of my conceptual model. So as I'm talking, I want to make sure that people are understanding um, the context in which my dissertation is oriented. So the focal relationship is nativity and preterm birth. I'm looking at duration of US residents. Um, and then I'm also looking at perceived racial discrimination, and I'll be looking at some risk factors in the quantitative data set too, some maternal health factors. Life, the life course perspective, particularly the Lewin-Halfen life course model, informs my work. And I'm also incorporating intersectionality theory and chronic stress theory, um, especially the intersectionality pieces because we're talking about three different types of identities of blackness, mm -hmm. as well as they're all women, so there's also their identity as women. And then, as you'll find out in the qualitative piece, this interesting concept that came up as a unique experience of black motherhood. OK, so that's where intersectionality comes in. Chronic stress, because we know stress affects preterm birth as a risk factor for preterm birth. So my quantitative strand is primarily here. The qualitative is where the racial discrimination piece comes in, because that's where that data is from. AIM-1 falls along here. That's looking at using New York City vital records data to look at duration and preterm birth differentials by nativity. And AIM-2 is exploring the role of racial discrimination and black identity further. So this is my conceptual model. So we'll start by doing a background on AIM-2. So Elo, Vang, and Colhane have the most recent, um, although now it's a little outdated, analysis of preterm birth differentials and small for gestational age differentials by nativity within the black population. So this article was really interesting when it came out because it cited the fact that there are actually differences in preterm birth rates for these three groups. So when you actually look at them not as one monolithic group, you'll find they found that African, African Americans had the highest rates, followed by Caribbeans, and then Africans had the lowest rates and were actually closer to white women. So that was really fascinating, right? And they cited looking at discrimination and duration as next steps for future research, which they were unable to do with their data set, which was national birth record data across 27 states. So the Dominguez et al. study provided strong quantitative evidence for the fact that discrimination may affect birth outcomes. So they found that differential exposures to self-reported racism over the life course could affect birth outcomes, as well as the fact that African Americans or US-born women in their population, they only looked at black people, so US born women were more closely resembled to the Caribbean population than the African population. So this makes you think, or made me think, that it'd be interesting to look at the foreign born population parsed out as opposed to just looking at the American population compared to the former population, which is also something that happens in the black diasporic literature. So the fact that they found that Caribbean was Caribbean, the perspective of Caribbean born women with their experiences of discrimination were closer to African Americans than African women. I thought it'd be interesting to interview all of the groups of black women. So my qualitative data interviews former mothers on their experiences as a migrant and their experiences as a black person in America. The reason why I asked questions about their experiences as a migrant was because the Dominguez et al. study wasn't able to figure out if the discrimination that Caribbean, so it's quantitative evidence, so if the responses that the Caribbean migrants 
were giving were due to their experience as a migrant or due to their experience as being black in America. So making that distinction. So I asked questions on both their experiences as immigrants and their experiences as black people in the US. So Mary Waters' book on black identities also provides some background that suggests that there are differential experiences debate based on nativity and the and qualitative evidence. And the new Rogetter study provides qualitative evidence on African, African American women of childbearing age and their experiences with racism. So this was exciting because there isn't a lot of qualitative work on this experience. And so they were able to provide some qualitative experiences and found that they didn't include foreign born women, but for African American women, they found there to be a connection, but they found there to be um, provided further evidence that experiences of discrimination will, could influence preterm birth outcomes based on the stress of these experiences. But again, they weren't able to look at foreign born black women. So the study that I conducted includes both US born and foreign born mothers. And they, I also ex only interviewed mothers who actually experienced pregnancy, labor, and delivery. So they interviewed mothers who were of childbearing age, but I was able to ask mothers about their experiences, seeking care, and when they delivered. Okay. Wait. Okay, sorry, one second. Okay, so as I talked about, we have knowledge of the different, the fact that there are differential rates of preterm birth across these three populations, but we're still working on the causal mechanisms that have these different relationships occur. Research has suggested looking at duration, looking at experiences with discrimination. There's definitely evidence that both of those, both of those mechanisms may be at play here. So. The purpose of this qualitative study informed by the life course health model is to examine the experience of African Americans, Caribbeans, and Africans living in New York City and used an interview guide focused on identity, discrimination, and their experiences seeking health care while pregnant in labor and delivery. So throughout this presentation, you'll see these three flags come up. So this represents the African American population, this represents the Caribbean population, this represents the African population. So just providing some context there. Okay. So the study design. So I was focused on only women who were over the age of 19 and over with at least one child who self-identified as either African American, <laughs> African, and Caribbean. So I define this as born in African American, born in America, and descend from US slavery. So if they had participants, I had people who wanted to be a part of the study, but they were born in America, but their parents were born somewhere else. And so I had to exclude them from the study. I have an asterisk. Under, so same for African and Caribbean, had to be born on the continent of Africa or born in a Caribbean country. There's an asterisk on Caribbean because I had one participant who had said that she was born in a Caribbean country, but then after the fact realized that she was born in the US, went to the Caribbean country two days later, or like, like, and then stayed there, and then came back to the US. So I went ahead and kept her in the study. <laughs> Although she was technically not born where she's in the Caribbean country. Okay. So New York City as the study site was chosen just because of the fact that it's uniquely situated with the population that I needed. It's a majority minority city, minority city and they also have a sizable foreign born population. I mean, I, mean you, I was able to get all the numbers that I needed and they definitely had access to several different communities of Africans and Caribbeans. So all the participants were you know, provided we were screened over the phone and then had to sign a written consent form. We went over the con con consent form carefully, um, and I was informed that they would all have pseudonyms. So anytime you hear a name today, it's not the, their actual name. Um, they were given a questionnaire on sociodemographic information that they filled out right before the survey, right before the interview. And they were all semi-structured interviews um, following a semi-structured interview guide. And they were aiming to be around an hour. Some were longer and some were shorter. Um, and I also was made sure to be conscious of my own positionality while doing this research. So I'm Haitian American. I was born here. My parents are from Haiti. So also making sure, and I'm a black person in America, and I'm a mom. So just making sure, although at the time I did these interviews, I hadn't yet given birth, but just making sure I was conscious of my own positionality while doing this research and being able to be con just be conscious of that as I look at, through my own lens at this data. So I used several tools. The, major, the main tool that I am using to analyze my data is called Sort and Sift, Think and Shift. Um, there's a citation included in my notes that I don't have. <laughs> um, and so I'm not sure how many people have heard of this. Have you heard of this? 
Okay, <laughs> great. So they do um, workshops in Chapel Hill predominantly with research talk. Um, but it's been a really, really cool tool to use. It really allows you to immerse yourself in the data. Um, it's very iterative, so it really is a wonderful analytic process to go through. There's a code book. Um, and so I have both inductive codes and deductive codes, as well as in vivo codes, which came up as I was looking at the data. So for instance, one of my in vivo codes is you wouldn't ask a white lady that. Another one is just brush it off. So those are examples of codes that came out as I was looking through the data. I use in vivo version 12. Um, the iterative analytic process really was informed by the sort and sift, think and shift, but involved reading, reading the transcripts, annotating, reading the transcripts, then coding, then writing individual memos on each participant, and then grouping the participants together and writing a group memo on each participant. So I ended up with 24 memos, um, 21 individuals, and then the three, like an, a Caribbean memo about all the Caribbean participants, an African memo, and so on. Um, the limitations of this study design are just the limitations that are subjected to qualitative research. I mean, it's a small sample of 21 women. Um, it's in New York City, which has advantages because it's unique, but also because it's unique, it, there's also generalizability issues there as well. Okay. So, overview of findings. So, I don't typically present with notes, but. <laughs> The data is so dense, and this is my first time presenting on it, that I decided to use notes today. Okay. Okay. So, essentially, I found that there were differences and similarities in the way that these three groups were oriented towards their black identity, the ways in which they interpreted and discussed and expressed their feelings on their experiences with discrimination. And then a third theme, which was particularly exciting for me as I wasn't necessarily directly what my research questions were looking at, but was this idea, this what I'm calling, this topic I'm calling black mom, but this concept of their black motherhood being unique as a, to any other type of motherhood. So that was really personally for me exciting and eye-opening because I didn't go into that thinking about that. I was thinking about identity and discrimination and then this just kept reoccurring and reoccurring as I was doing my topic monitoring, which is a method in sort and sift, think and shift where you look for particular topics and it just kept popping out and it was to the point where I couldn't ignore it. Um, which is where the in vivo code, you wouldn't ask a white lady that came up. So the theme under identity is called the pivotal moment they learned America. When I came here, then I realized that there were different races. And these quotes that I have next to the themes are from participants. The second theme is keeping discrimination at bay. It never bothered me because I didn't own it. And the third theme is called the inescapable and constant emotional labor of the black mama. You wouldn't ask a white lady that. Okay. Okay, so let's unpack that first theme a little bit. So when I talk about identity first, I want to make sure that I'm clear. I'm referring to one component of my participants' identity, their shared identity as black women, but also more specifically their identity as black mothers. And so obviously all of these women know they're black from the very beginning. But when I talk about that pivotal moment they learned America, what I'm referring to is the pivotal moment, that experience that taught them that being black in America is different and subjects you to an institutional system, a structural system, and an interpersonal system that's engulfed in racism and white supremacy and all of the different elements that go into that. It's that moment where they realize that experience, where they realize their life would be different. So that's the pivotal moment that I'm talking about there when I talk about black identity. So there are some differences in how they learn about their black identity in America. Timing and familial involvement are involved in that. But there are also some similarities in the topics that they expressed and that are pride and onus, but there are differences in the way they talked about pride and onus. So, it's complicated, <laughs> to say the least. Okay, so before I talk about timing, I want to just iterate the importance of timing. So this is from the Lou and Halfon model of the life course health model. So life course perspective is a sociological um, theory, but it was adapted for public health by Lou and Halfon. It's this life course health model. This is particularly important for my research because this is actually um, from their article that was on birth outcomes for black mothers. So you see this, this arc right here is African Americans. Is this working? No. Okay. And so this, the green arrows would be protective factors, the red arrows would be risk factors. The concept being that over the course of their life, so 
five years puberty pregnancy life course, they're experiencing more risk factors than protective factors. Okay? So it would make their potential reproductive potential lower. Meaning reproductive potential, meaning potential to have good birth outcomes or good reproductive health. Okay? And then they have white women up here, right? With increased protective factors and minimal risk factors over the course of their life, right? And so based on the quantitative research, you could posit that Caribbean women would be here and African women would be up here. Okay. This is what I'm positing based on quantitative research, right? So just to get a picture of when I say, when I talk about the timing from the qualitative literature on when they experience these outcomes, you can kind of picture this life course health model. Okay. So timing and familial involvement in these pivotal moments when they learn to be black as identity in America, as opposed to a cultural identity within one's own community, right? So there's sort of two black identities that they're, you know, straddling here. So essentially, the overview of this finding was that for African Americans, the timing was a lot earlier. So that obviously that's due to the fact that they're born in this country. So they're born in this country. So you have an earlier introduction. But the, also the familial involvement is a key component there because they have generations of people, including their parents, who also lived in this country and can inform them on this black identity we're talking about, the black identity within the white context or within the American context, right? Which is something that the foreign-born people don't have. So reminder, all the foreign people were people who immigrated here on their own, typically, from their sending country. So they don't have this familial context, right? So African-Americans experienced learning about their black identity at an earlier age, and also their family was involved with that conversation always for all my participants. Um, and for the foreign born, none of them had any familial involvement in their discovery. And for most of them, it occurred when they arrived here, typically when having to fill out forms or with interactions they had with um, often other black people, but with other people. OK. Um, so. There were several examples of African Americans discussing when they were made to realize they were black, from receiving white dolls at Christmas to being called the N-word, or when they entered elementary school and noticed all of the different faces. And every African American participant's experience, their mother or grandmother or uncle, etc., told them a story or would consistently in passing mention what being black meant to them. Literally tell them, you're black. Two of the African American participants actually attended Afrocentric preschools and received their early introduction to blackness in that fashion. One example that stood out to me that I'll read today was from Doreen, an African-American mom, who shared an experience that she had with her grandmother at the age of seven when traveling down south. Me and my grandmother pulled over by a cotton field, and she got out. She took a piece, and she said, this is what we had to do forever. This is the difference between us and them. We picked it. They profited from it. This explanation of what it means to be black is both historical and political. For the African-American participants, history and politics very much shaped their black narrative whether it was stories from family members in the Black Panther Party for Angela, or the curriculum at the Afrocentric schools for Monica and Alicia, history, society, and politics were weaved into their Black and American narrative and upheld by family members. Right? So this was something that the foreign-born population was not able to express in the same way. Their introductions, their timing of when they learned about their black identity literally came from when they arrived here. And often was, I had to fill out this form, and I didn't know what box I was supposed to check. So I asked somebody. They asked, they looked at me and said, fill out the black form. So I filled that out, and I never asked again. Um, or from arriving here, and like some of the participants came as young as high school. It was about the youngest time they came. And so they came here, still on their own, though. Like their parents were already here and then sent for them to come. So they came, arrived. They went to school. And the other black American students made it clear to them that they were foreign black. And, and so that for them was, um, I'll get into that later when we talk about onus. And, but that for them, this, this accent of their foreign identity as opposed to their black identity was confusing for them. And so they talk about navigating that as well. OK, so the other theme was this. Uh, this concept of pride that they feel about their identity and culture. And so across all groups, there's a sense of pride in their identities. For the foreign born, it was a combined country pride and black pride, whereas for African American, it was a black pride um, concept. So for Angela, an African American mom says, we were in prayer picking cotton. We were in prayer getting beat. We were in prayer watching our children get snatched from us. We were in prayer. So our resiliency level is very, very high. When I think about the history of African people in this country, yeah, I have pride. I mean, there's a texture to black people that's very complex. 
I'm proud in that. There is a history, there's a story, there's a narrative. Some ugly, some beautiful, um, but mostly about resilience, you know? So there's this sense of, for all, that re quote really was representative of the way a lot of African-American moms talked about being black. So while in the same instance of having necessarily this onus, this like history that can be dark at times, there's this pride, the fact that you're still here, that your generations and people behind you all were uplifted and resilient through that. So their pride is really around being black. Um, and so for the foreign born participants though, there was a pride in being Caribbean, a pride whether that's Jamaican or Haitian, and there was a pride in being for the Africans Nigerian or Ghanaian or you know, whatever country they were from. So their pride wasn't necessarily like, I'm black and American, I'm proud of that. It was I'm Nigerian and American, I'm proud of that. So Kafi, an African mom, says, I still carry the culture that my mother taught me, despite the fact that she's not here. I'm here, and nothing's changed. My household with my kids, I do the same things I do back home. I just love everything about being African. When I'm at work and I wear my attire, people appreciate, oh, I want to have this, oh, I want to have that. So for me, being that I know what my culture is, I know that I have something that I can always run back to. It just means the world. I have something that makes me stand out, something that is unique about me. That's what I really love about my culture and about being African. So. It really struck out to me that you said, I have something I can always run back to. I mean, if that's not a perfective factor, I mean. So, and I'll say about, the, she mentioned too, wearing the attire. A lot of the African participants I interviewed were dressed, except for one, were dressed in their, what they would wear if they were back home. So, whereas the Korean participants were wearing like, what I guess you'd call American clothes, I mean, jeans, a shirt, you know, whatever. But um, they were all dressed traditionally. Um, and some of them had been here, Coffee, for instance, had been here since she was in high school. So there's a strong cultural tension there. Um, and she talks about that, how important that is to her as, she, as she's raising her kids. Um, so yeah, the strong sense of pride and culture in terms of where you're from. So now we'll get to the onus. So in the same instance, the concept of whether or not blackness was an onus was an aspect that came up came up a lot too. So they would talk about this pride, but on the other side of that was the sense of like, and everything's harder for us and everything, you know, we have to watch our backs here and there and we have to do this. So this like sense of this burden too that comes with being black. But for the foreign born, this was particularly interesting because for some of them, okay. So for the Caribbean born participants, they cite, for African born participants and Caribbean born, they cite that being black does not affect them, right? So they would talk about the fact that, no, it's not a burden, or no, why would it, no, I still am able to get a job, and no, it doesn't bother me because I just, I don't let it bother me. Like, it's just the people who let it get to them, like, I don't let it do that to me, right? So there's a sort of disconnect from the structural racism that's at play, the systematic pieces, but rather just saying that, like, these are not barriers to me, right? So. Evelyn, a Caribbean-born mom, shared that she often doesn't think of her race when she goes places. It's her children that might point it out to her. So her children being American-born um, when they're in predominantly white spaces. They'll say, look at all these white people, mommy. But she doesn't particularly notice, as she says. Um, Trina, a Caribbean mom, said, I don't really see myself. Like, I know I'm black, but I don't really like, like if I walk into an area or place where it's predominantly white or black or a different race, I don't really be like self-conscious, like, oh my God, what are they gonna think of me? I kind of go in there and I'm like, you know, I just blend with everybody. I mean, I don't really think about my race, right? So, and this is also a Caribbean mom who came here at a younger age too. She actually came here in elementary school. So, here for a very long time, but doesn't see that. This sentiment was not echoed by any of the African-American participants. Monica, an African-American mom states, there are problems that come along with being black. These are the problems that come along with being black in a mostly not black society. I guess that has also like not only been not black, but then like anti-black for a shit ton of time. And it's just now getting on board with blackness. Well, kinda. So that quote right there really summarized, sorry for cursing. <laughs> I was like, am I gonna curse? Am I not gonna curse? Um, but that sentiment right there really summarized how the African-American participants felt. Like, there's been this huge history and journey here. And um, we've just now are getting to the point, at, well, as she articulated, of kind of not being anti-black, which we can argue about that piece. Um, so 
But also for the foreign born participants, there is also a different aspect to being black in America that weighs on them, and that is the potential loss of their culture or an erasure of their foreign identity. So there, there was a lot of concerns, particularly from the African born participants, that people didn't see them as foreign and that they were losing that identity. And they had to subject, really, in a way, they talked about being subjected to this blackness in America piece. Um, so this was particularly relevant in the African born participants. So Dafina was particularly troubled by the concept that being black in America ha meant having to be something she was not, using her words. She was conscious of the fact that although she may not identify as African American, the perceptions of her by others mattered as well, maybe even more than what she considered herself to be at times. And that for her was extremely frustrating. She says, it was hard because I have to check a box that I don't identify with. And whether or not I check that box, I am that box. In America, there's no other option. They say other, but if I say Guinea, who's going to go look for some papers where Guinea is or what Ghanaian means to begin with? So that was hard. It still is hard now, just like to check the box and keep moving. So here she's discussing that burden, that burden of being foreign born and feeling like you're not being seen every time you have to check that black, I think it's black slash African American now or black African American. So, and then only being solely viewed as African American, at least on those forms. Okay. So in summary, the elements were here were timing of learning identity and the familial family involvement in the identity process with African Americans learning it earlier and having their family involved, which the foreign born did not have. The pride that one felt in their identity, so they all had this sense of pride in their identity, but for the foreign born it was more cultural or country specific. And the onus of one's identity, which is something that they all articulated, but in different ways. So the African American mom, as we discussed, it was more so this onus of being black in America, but for the foreign born, there was also this, there was really this onus of being foreign born in America, but not being viewed as foreign born in America and what that does to their sense of self. Okay, so the second theme is keeping discrimination at bay. It never bothered me because I didn't own it. So the types of discrimination that mothers were exposed to and how the experiences were interpreted and reflected on were the patterns that came up in these, the results for this theme. So there are predominantly two types of discrimination, explicit slash overt or blatant acts of discrimination or microaggressions. Now the microaggressions were more frequently reported than the explicit acts. The explicit acts were also only reported by the African American participants. Um, and for the microaggressions, there was only one African-born participant who reported experiencing discrimination from white people at all. Um, and for the Caribbean, it was mixed. There were some that reported it, some that didn't. So the Caribbeans are really this mixed group that fall in between the two um, points of Africans and African-Americans. So the, for, the ex, for the explicit um, forms of discrimination, there were three. Um, so all of them were when they were traveling somewhere. So for Angela, it was when she was at a restaurant in Florida and she was refused service. At, even though white people came in after her, they were, they were um, served before. This resulted in her confronting the waiter and the waitress and the, really the whole entire staff. Um, and that resulted in an argument, but then they never ate there. They just left while well, they were kicked out. Um, and then another one was Serena, an African-American mom who was traveling down south, went into a gas station and then felt so many stares and dirty looks and was being, um, like when people walk by you, sort of shoulder checked. So she decided to leave without getting food or gas, which is what she went there for. And the last was Monica, an African-American mom who shared that she was in college not too long after Obama's inauguration. And essentially, someone tried to run them off the road. And when they put their window down, the person put their window down, yelled some explicitives at them. Um, and they rolled their window back up. Because as she says, we're not, we just rolled our windows back up. And we were like, he's not, on, he's not the one to yell back at, because he clearly has some deep-seated hate for everyone in this car that he's never met, you know? So, so these. These examples of overt experience of discrimination weren't reported at all by the foreign-born participants, but they did report microaggressions, mainly being followed around stores or um, um, being ignored when they were maybe at a bakery or something and wanted something and just not being called on. They reported these as microaggressions. Um, there was also some times where the foreign-born reports something as a microaggression. For instance, one. An African-born family, a uh, Caribbean-born family actually reported not being served. But they talked about that as a microaggression, so I coded it as such. Um, but as I said, Angela talked about that as a blatant form. 
which I would more categorize that personally myself as a blatant form. But so it was this balance too of trying to balance what I thought and then with what they're thinking. You know, we talk about that positionality. Um, oh, I realized I was supposed to be on this slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different interpretations. So African American moms were always able to recognize discrimination when it occurred. They talked about an instance and they talked about it being discrimination. They talked about why it was discrimination and why it was messed up and how they felt. Um, African, African moms either did, did not believe that it ever occurred and they had no experiences to relate to me on. And there's a caveat there that I'll get into later. Caribbeans were interesting in that they were the only group to experience what I'm calling post-experiential processing, meaning they experienced something that was discrimination, but in the moment they did not think of it as discrimination, but then were able to report to me that later on when they talked to somebody about it, that person told them that that was discrimination, right? Um, so for example, Evelyn, a Caribbean mom who experienced what I would categorize as explicit discrimination, did not think of it as racist at the time that it occurred. It was not until afterwards when recounting the story to co-workers that she was informed the experience was indeed an act of racial discrimination. She shares that she was lost while she pulled over into an elderly white couple's driveway. So I stopped there and I asked them, sir, I'm a little lost. So she, also I should clarify, she pulled into their driveway at night um, while she was completely lost. Her phone wasn't working and had no GPS and it was a long gravel driveway. I'm just gonna, context, okay? So Evelyn, a Caribbean mom said, sir, I'm a little lost. So she came, she also had two kids in the back and she came out of her car to talk to him because he was sitting on the porch. I'm a little lost, do you know how to go to? And he stopped me and said, get out. Get out, I don't know, get out. So then, yeah, that white man, the two ladies, they didn't say anything, but the white man, he just said, get out. And so then I started back talking to him and when they say, uh, when they say get out, so there, I have to turn, so I had to go to the road, the road was narrow, so I backed up in the grass and that made it even worse. He started screaming, get off my grass, you such and such, get off my grass, you such and such. I think they called me some, some name, I don't remember, so. But you know, and then I'm thinking, oh, they're just old, you know, I'm not, I'm not really, and she laughs here, I'm just thinking they're old, you know, I'm thinking like, they're just old, so I go around and I go about my way. Yeah, but when I went to work and I told the people the story, they say, yeah, those are, you know, they're racist. You know what the thing is? I didn't look at it as discrimination. When I was telling other people the story, what happened to me, they said, oh, this is discrimination, right? So they're yelling at her to get out. She backed up in the grass, they all got off the grass. It was very like, to me, that's pretty blatant, but she did not think of it as such. She told the story and just thought that they were old and so maybe they were like a little, a old angry people, I guess. Um, so that's the element of interpretation there. We're talking about how you might interpret a situation. So. Um, and then another, Trino, a Caribbean mom, also had another experience of post-experiential processing. But that quote really represents well how you could experience something, but depending on the context of your identity, you might not refer to it as such. So then we're talking about outlook. So. You interpreted experience, but what's your outlook on it after the fact? Are you angry about it and hold on to it for a really long time? Or are you like, okay, those crazy old people who might have been racist, I'm just gonna let that go and let that be them, right? So across the board, there are two sentiments expressed on discriminatory experiences, outrage or brushing it off. The African born were the quickest to report that they brushed off these types of experiences. Now, initially I reported that the African born did not report any instances of discrimination. They didn't report any instances of discrimination from white people. In their words, they reported instances of discrimination from black people. So in those instances of discrimination, they, their outlook on them was to brush it off, right? So followed by the Caribbean born and then the African American born who, were, who had the highest likelihood of reporting feeling frustrated or upset by situations and less likely to quote, just brush it off. For instance, Angela, who had the experience in Florida <laughs> at the restaurant where she wasn't, where she was refused service and then got into an argument says, I was very angry. I didn't feel less than myself. I just felt like, how dare you? And who do you think you are? And I felt more the so that she was ignorant. I was insulted. I guess I was insulted more so than I was angry. And you know, the disrespect. I mean, you go out to eat and you're sitting there first. You shouldn't, I used to wait tables. Don't do that to me. That was wrong. First of all, you're wrong. You know what I mean? And now the reason why you're wrong is even more, you know, um, egregious. So it's like, come on, you know what I mean? Okay, so she's talking about feeling angry and then disrespected and insulted, right? Whereas Evelyn, who had the experience where she was chased off the lawn says, 
I'm not even holding on to that. No grudge against it. That doesn't make me like hate white people or think about like how racist they are. I'm not, I wasn't mad. No, I wasn't mad. I was like, F you. I was happy I said F you. So she did say F you as she drove away to them and she was very proud of that. Um, so yeah, she talked about the experience very, just sort of like she was telling a funny story. Um, so again, the caveat here is that African participants only reported discrimination, quote discrimination in their words from black people. So for instance, this quote from Tafina really I felt like captured what many of them felt when they talked about this was, I don't think anyone wants to be put to the side because of the way they look or the way they talk. It's not a good feeling, especially coming from another black person. That to me was harder to take than a white person, to be honest. At least I can see the difference between you and I if you were white, it's like whatever. I can understand you being raised thinking that you are, you know, at the top of the pyramid. But for another black person that goes through the struggles that I'm facing now, for you to actually put that on me, for you to say that, it's like, wow. So, and that came up a lot, the sentiment of like, feeling as if they were discriminated against by other black people and being really confused about it and feeling very, um, just like the wow, like feeling like I just didn't understand why they would do that. Um, so it's, it was, it's complicated. And so the second theme. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay. Um, so was the, the theme on discrimination. So the three patterns that were here as well was their exposure. Oh, did I? Oh, did, oh, did I accidentally go backwards? Yes. Okay. So we're at the third theme. Great. So the third theme was, for me, the most exciting theme was this inescapable, inescapable and constant emotional labor of the black mama. You wouldn't ask a white lady that. So as I said early, earlier, this quote right here is from a participant and also became an in vivo quote of mine. So it was coming up not just for that participant, but other participants. And they were, liter they were specifically saying, that wouldn't happen to me if I, was, if I was white. It just kept coming up. So I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Right? So the patterns here all fall under two sub-themes. And this idea of the fact that no matter what their nativity was, they were all subjected when receiving care for pregnancy, labor, and delivery to certain experiences. It was supported by the African-born, the Caribbean-born, and the African-American-born. So even though the African-born didn't call these experiences discrimination, they were experiencing them, right? So the first is the long-standing racial bias in healthcare is the first theme. So as we know, or as many of us know, um, the field of obstetrics and gynecology has a long history of devaluing black bodies, right? So Jane Marion Sims, the father of gynecology, um, or is considered to be the father of gynecology, he came up with many of his procedures for fistulas and other reproductive health problems by experimenting on essentially enslaved black women without giving them anesthesia, right? So, and this was who was called the father of gynecology. There was a statue of him up in Central Park until pretty recently. So this is the history that black women are being exposed to when having to seek care. So in the element that was important here is that being pregnant accentuated their blackness. This was reported across the board, but especially by African Americans, that they felt like they were more visible when they were pregnant. So, I mean, which is kind of natural for all women, like when you're pregnant, people are like, oh, you know, I won't touch your belly and such. But they felt like it put these stereotypes on them that they didn't always necessarily felt fit. So maybe that they were single moms or that they were on welfare or that they would qualify for such or many of these stereotypes that go along with black women. So, and when they were actually with their providers, these would sometimes come up. So Malia, an African-American mom share, shares, the anesthesi anesthesiologist tells me, I'll see you next year. And I'm like, who are you gonna see next year? Not me. And you know, as we're sitting and I'm talking about it, I realized how inappropriate that was. He definitely thought that I was gonna be pregnant again next year or this year. But I'm like, in the grand scheme of things, and honestly, considering what I had been through, it wasn't funny. And while I didn't necessarily take it the way I'm sitting here processing it now, but I knew then, it's still like, I didn't laugh. I wasn't amused. And I was like, please don't put that on me. I don't want to be here next year. I don't know if I ever want to be here again. So she sort of had a traumatic birth experience and she needed an anesthesiologist. And that was the comment that he said. So it's that 
concept of like, although this is historical, there are these experiences that women are still having pre in present day. So and this is in line with the stereotype or portrayal of black women being welfare queens who have babies one after the other in order to take advantage of the welfare system. Another ex example of stereotypes that black mothers might be subjected to is the absent father. Participants indicate that they felt it was often assumed that black fathers were, were not involved and that they were unmarried or single moms. Trina, a Caribbean mom, shared her experience with black, with black mom stereotypes. And she says, so they will have this stereotype of black women. So she's a Caribbean mom, but she's articulating the fact that she knows that there are stereotypes on black women. That they're not married, that they get food stamps, they got 100, they got 100 baby daddies. Like I remember one time I was somewhere with my kids and this lady said, oh, these are your children? And I said, yeah. And they're like, oh, do they have the same father? I'm like, yes. And she's like, oh, OK, OK. Like, you wouldn't ask a white lady that. If she was with two of her babies, you would not. But you're asking me if they have the same father. That's why I was just like, yes, these are both my husband's kids. Right? So in a lot of women, Caribbean or African or African-American, reported whether it was strangers or their nurses or their providers, they had these encounters where they were either offered WIC without being asked questions about their employment or their income, which happened often. Um, and often happened many times, so because they see a different nurse every time or a different, you know, tech every time. Um, so this concept of just constantly these stereotypes being imposed on them. So stereotypes are one thing, but disrespectful care is another. And this uh, Caribbean mom shared that when she had second degree tears after giving birth and had to deal with a provider whose care was reflective of disrespecting the black mom's body, I teared both times after I gave birth to my babies, and the doctor that sold me up with my first kid, he didn't give me any medication. He was like, oh, you know, she can take it. <coughs> you know, and it reminded me of, I don't know if you read Medical Apartheid, but you know, just all these experiments that they would do on black women back in the day, and even black men. Like, they thought that we were stronger, and of course we are, but you know, but still, like, we shouldn't be subjected to, like, more pain. I was like, how could you, like, why? Like, that's just, I can't. I couldn't even imagine why someone would do that. Just give me local anesthesia. I didn't get any anesthesia, so I can feel things. And I told him, like, I was like, you know I didn't get any anesthesia, by the way. I mean, you would know if I did, because I would have the whatever. And I'm like, I didn't get anesthesia, so can you give me, like, some pain medication? And he was just like, hold on, it's almost done. It wasn't almost done. He kept going. So I actually felt the needle and the thread go through, go through to sew me up. And yeah, there were women there, too. The nurses, and they were just like, you know, hush, hush, he's almost done. Right? So that was, I mean, her whole entire experience, I mean, that's just one quote that I used, but there are many examples I could give from just hers that, I mean, I have chills right now as I'm reading it. Um, it was just a very tough one. And so there we talk about the internal and external navigation that one's going through. She actually did say something. You know, but then to be sort of literally dismissed, like, hold on, it's almost done, you can take it. And then to have other women in the room, I think, added to the element for her, for them to say, hush, hush, she's almost done, right? So just the sense of being pregnant and having to deliver in a hospital, most of the time for these women, are subjecting themselves to this experience with this system that has a history of devaluing them. And you have to, when you're pregnant, go to the certain amount of times, you know, see a provider. So it exposes them to have a higher, higher likelihood of, it gives them a higher exposure potential to experiencing these sorts of things than if they were not pregnant. So Kathy, an African mom, also dealt with disrespectful care from the providers during her delivery. However, she did not allow herself to, as she quote, be too phased by the experience that she had. I remember when I was having my second child, the lady, she was like, well, you need to open your legs because you opened it when he was giving it to you, so you need to open it now. There's no way that you can say that to a person who's giving birth, who is in labor. Ignorant people, it's just ignorant people. Because for me, as a human being, you should always treat people as you want to be treated. You can say some nasty stuff to someone. I'm pretty sure if I was the one that said that to you, you would go off. So why would you say that to somebody else, especially to a person that you know is in pain? So there's that notion, you know, with both of those that this sort of like, just do what I'm telling you to do and, you know, we just have to go about this business. Um, but, for as, but for her, as she said, she just kind of like chalked it up to this woman being ignorant, right? And she, and she said that a lot during a lot of her different interactions. So, um, 
so that those are the elements of being disrespected, like literally being disrespected during care. But there was also the element of, which students said this is disrespect as well, but to not being listened to. So Doreen, an African-American mom, shares an experience that she had with her provider where she articulated what she'd been doing to take care of her prenatal care, and he didn't believe her. So he was telling her what to, telling her things that she needed to do, but she was saying she was doing those things. So every step I knew what to do to make sure that I was a normal pregnancy, I did. So don't tell me that I didn't do something. You may know book, but I know me. Your main objective should have been patient care. And if I said I had that test and I told you exactly what a test consisted of and what I've been doing, obviously I've had it. You should have took that. You don't need the God complex, but they wouldn't talk to a white woman like that. So there's that quote again, right? So it's consistent I, notion that they're not as important as white women and that their bodies don't have the same value as white women, that their voices don't have the same value as white women, and that if they were white, they wouldn't be treated that way. Just kept coming up when they were talking about receiving care for their babies, for their pregnancy, labor and delivery. Um, I think I'll skip that quote. But, so we'll move on to the um, emotional labor and fatigue that comes with having to consistently battle these experiences when you're going for all of your appointments or even through your pregnancy and labor and delivery. So, so a lot of them talk about how these stereotypes became something that, that they were became aware of. So for the foreign born participants, when they were subjected to this, they did not expect to be subjected to this. Whereas for the African American participants, there was sort of this context of like, this might happen because I experienced these types of discriminatory acts outside of this hospital. So it happening inside of this hospital isn't too crazy of an idea. For the foreign born, when they were telling these stories, it was more of like a shock of like, you know, like, and then they said that and that was crazy. And then, you know, which it all is crazy, but there was definitely more of like a, so, Kia, uh, Alicia, a Caribbean mom, uh, an African mom, expresses the fact that she became aware, like in the moment, became aware that they were doing this because she was black. I mean, it just made me more aware of, you know, the stereotypes they talk about that, that are compared to black people and black women. And I was just like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess this is how it is. I don't really let it get me down, I guess. Like I said before, I just try to be who I am and not judge. And I guess being who I am means not getting offended and not being angry. So just the notion there of the fact that she realized that these stereotypes were happening to her because she was black, um, which was a journey for her being the African, African born. And she was the only African born woman who talked about these experiences as a form of discrimination um, in the context of the providers or as a form of like, this might be related to race. She didn't use the word discrimination, but that this might be related to race, right? Um, so, and then there's this element of medical distrust that black women have a reason to have. And so for Kia, a Caribbean mom, this intersection of stereotypes and disrespectful care and medical trust all came into play when her midwife was pushing contraceptives, contraceptives on her and she felt very disrespected by it. So I was telling the midwife and she, um, that I was thinking about going into midwifery and she totally discouraged me. She was saying all these things and assumed that I didn't have requirements, like my first degree. And just her whole attitude, I felt like she was, she just didn't have too much respect for me. Maybe because I had my second child two years after my first, which I kind of just got that vibe from her. Throughout my visits, all of my prenatal visits, she just kept trying to push contraceptives on me. And just how she would speak to me about having my kids, you know, my two children and not being married. And all of this is insinuated, like it's nothing that she came out right and said. I just remember the feelings that were left with me. So there's this notion of these feelings that were left with her. And even when she was talking about it, there was like this heaviness on her of like, seeing this midwife as someone she could talk to. So she mentioned that she was thinking about going to midwifery and then immediately sort of feeling like this um, sort of just disrespect and like dis being discouraged and the midwife assuming she didn't have her first degree. So I want to end that not all of the experiences were bad. Um, so I'll just, Dafina had a good experience when she went to a birthing center and had black midwives, which she specifically sought out after her first experience had not been great at a hospital with white providers. And she said, I walked in there, I didn't feel like they were looking at me, which was crazy. I didn't feel like they were looking at me as I'm black. They were just looking at a pregnant, pregnant person. Usually I walk in, I know right away people look at me because I'm black. Whereas there I was just a pregnant person. I guess my pregnancy took over my race, which was amazing. Right? So this idea of being in a place where you could not be simply the race that you are. But, and for Dafina, again, she was the African-American mom who was very conflicted by 
having to identify as black in America and not being able to be her, who she felt was her true self. So the three patterns were that identity did not allow them to escape such experiences. So no matter where they were born, they, were, they could report these experiences. And they were subjected to this racial provider, bias of providers and also the emotions that was resulted from these experiences. So the takeaway here is this unique experience that black moms have, um, that there were some differences by nativity, and that being exposed to the US is essentially what exposed them to these types of discriminatory acts and discriminatory care from providers. So there's a lack of research on black migrants in particular. Um, you can see it kind of in the thread of the quotes that I said, but also it's well known that there's hard to find data sets that have large numbers of black people sometimes, and then you have black migrants on top of that can be very difficult. Um, and so knowing about the foreign born experience and the black mom experience is something that would be a huge contribution to the field. And this can imp impact practice, policy, and intervention. So one thing we talk about with practice, when stats are collected on preterm birth or infant mortality, they're just reported as like black altogether, white altogether. So something that I'm finding from my quantitative analysis is that African women are, rates are only slightly higher than white women, like really only slightly higher than white women. You have Caribbean women are in the middle and then you have African Americans are at the top of that. So if you're lumping them all together, you could have a masking effect that's going on, right? So you aren't, you aren't even aware of the true disparity there and it's already disparate, but there could be a masking effect going on by not, not following a practice of separating those groups out which they are for Asian and Latino. So we know how to do it. Um, as well as policy and interventions that could take place to <coughs> combat these sort of experiences that black women are experiencing. So future research could examine this, expand the sample. So it's only 24 women, seven African-American, seven Caribbean, seven African, as well as examine the embodiment of these stressors by nativity. So talk about the fact that these stressors exist, but what does it actually do to your body physiologically? Um, and also there are several intervention ideas I have after doing this research that would also be great for future research. So thank you so much. This is my first time presenting on this research. How cute is that? Oh, so, okay.